What's up, guys? It's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Today we have with us Kevin Wenning. Kevin is a adventure travel leader and combines traveling with cycling and photography. Today he's going to be talking about how you, an attorney or law student or young professional, can go on crazy adventures and if you have the right stuff for it. So stay tuned. It's going to be a good one. Hello, Kevin Wenning. How are you? Doing well today. Good to meet you, Chris. It's a pleasure to have you on. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I've uh, enjoyed listening to your podcast. Yeah. Glad to glad to be a guest today. Of course. Where are you located right now? Are you uh, in the states? I am actually, and most of the time I'm I'm actually working from home. I uh, I'm in northern Colorado. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I run cycling tours for photographers. That's kind of my my main <laughs> my main project. Uh, my website is intentionallylost.com, and I, I started off kind of in photography uh, a long, long time ago, doing sort of commercial photography, where I would you know work for clients, and then I got into travel photography, and I was trying to make that work as uh, as a travel photographer, kind of writing for publications, taking photos for publications, mm-hmm. and decided, eh, that's not really for me. Uh, but I, I worked that path for a little while, and then I kind of discovered my own style of photography and travel through trial and error, uh, just working on it over the years. And, uh, and I turned it into a, into a business, kind of a, a, a side project. But my passion really is doing things and, and helping other people to do things that, that move them forward in life, that, that aren't just about like maintaining the daily, you know, this, I do this and then I do this and then I get my paycheck and I go home and I mm-hmm. get to my weekend. And because, I mean, we all do that. That's part of being a responsible adult. But looking for things that, that kind of take you forward in your life, that give you those aha moments or kind of fulfill your soul, if you will, rather than just kind of getting through the day. Yeah. And what was your aha moment? I, I try and have one every week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So, so many different ones. It's just for me anyway, it's, it's embracing the different stages that we go through in life. I yeah. think, uh, I mean, I've, I've worked several different jobs. I've worked for myself in the past and I'm, I'm moving back that direction again to just completely work for myself. But it, for me, I think the, the aha moment was whatever, whatever I'm doing right now, this is what I've got to put myself into and just be proud of it, make the most of it, be good at it rather than, mm-hmm. you know, wake up and go, Oh, I don't like what I'm doing today. I don't like my life. I don't like my job. I don't like whatever. Just, you know what, this is what you've committed to yourself to right now. Just do it and do it well and be proud of it. Yeah. And then it might change in a month or two months or whatever. But uh, just kind of so my aha moment was like, don't be dissatisfied with the moment. Just I'm going to pour myself into it and make the most of it. And that will lead me to something else down the road. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, also, I follow you on Instagram and your pictures are are pretty amazing. Well, thank Not you. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm located in New Jersey, so I definitely get jealous when I see all those uh, those beautiful photos. <laughs> Well, that that's what that's what got me into into travel photography was kind of you know following other other photographers and, and travelers and seeing what they were doing. This was you know in the days when it was just personal blogs before yeah. Instagram, before Facebook even existed, and yeah. and that's what got me into it was you know watching other people's photos, going wow, that looks like an awesome lifestyle. I want to go do that myself. Yeah, definitely. All right, so let's get started uh, on the questions. Uh, do you prefer to travel to remote places? or more around make major cities? I like to do both. Uh, my personality, I, I prefer to travel more to remote places. And by remote, I, I mean, uh, you know, getting off the plane and then getting out of the major city as soon as possible. So I'll, I'll take a taxi, get a guide and go out to a, a remote beach. That's like a two hour drive from the main city that I flew into. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for me, that's, that does a, a number of different things for me, but, uh, as I've as I've gotten older too, and and done more travel, I, I I do enjoy spending time in major cities as well. So when I was younger and I had uh, less responsibility, and I could <laughs> I could break away for two or three weeks at a time, I would go do a lot more remote travel. Uh, as I get older, and I I find that I have to travel and come back home and get back to my daily life or my responsibilities sooner. Uh, I I've kind of mix the two Mm -hmm. uh, styles. So preference, I I would go remote if I really had to choose, but uh, I can appreciate both and I I do both on a regular Mm -hmm. basis. 
And what are some positives to traveling to, to remote places? <clears throat> the the biggest positive, I guess, to to traveling in remote places is is actually disconnecting uh, for me. Yeah. A- and my <clears throat> my company, my my brand name is intentionally lost, and that that happened kind of on travels with with friends. I would I would be the person that like everybody's everybody sets up camp and they they get to they get to business and then I just kind of take off and I disappear I go for a hike by myself I would yeah. uh, rather than staying at the hotel I would just go walk around a city by myself and that's my preferred style when I get to when I get to a new location I'll mm-hmm. drop my bags at the hotel and then just go out for a walk uh, often without my camera I'm not thinking about taking photos I don't have a goal in mind I'm just I want to go see what's there uh, so the remote travel uh, the benefit of it is is just not having an agenda, not having an itinerary. I'm going to just go see where the day takes me. And mm-hmm. I like to say that getting getting lost when you travel leads to experiencing things that you didn't know were there yeah. uh, as far as the place goes and experiencing things that you didn't know were there within yourself. Like you you just surprise yourself. You know, wow, I, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know I was going to yeah. enjoy that experience and, and it takes you to places that you didn't expect. Yeah, I, uh, I have to improve that also in me because I still use the GPS to go places where I fully know how to get there. You know, like <laughs> I'll get in the car and it could be a place I go every day and I automatically go to Google Maps. <laughs> right. It's, it's just a yeah. reflex. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but when you get to a remote place and you pull out your phone and nothing loads and you just realize you have no reception, you're like, okay, <laughs> what did I do before internet? How do I, how, how do I handle this? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, since we're talking about that, can you name some negatives that you've experienced? Yeah, it, I mean, there's, there's a ton. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I think, yeah, you and I kind of talked about this or emailed beforehand uh, about this, uh, about this interview. And that's, that is the biggest reason why people don't go on remote travels or don't go and travel without an itinerary because there are so many unknowns. You don't know what's going to happen. Uh, like, I mean, anything could happen. Yeah. And then once you get over that threshold of realizing, oh crap, there's no plan today. What do I do? Then, then you break through and you go, oh, okay, I can handle this. This is, yeah. you know, I don't have to have somebody telling me what to do. It's like, like when you're at work and you always have a boss or a manager saying, this is what we're going to work on next. This is the roadmap for today. This is the roadmap for this month. You go, okay, well, I've got to do that. That's my checklist, right? Yeah. And then if you go work for yourself or you you get promoted into a position, you're like, okay, nobody's telling me what to do now. How do I handle this? You know what? I got this. I can, I can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's that initial trepidation of, okay, I've got no plan. What do I do now? Yeah. Uh, like – a, a quick story. Uh, in China, I was, where was I? Guilin, Guilin, China. Uh, it's the place in the south of China where you see the pictures of the giant karsts coming up mm-hmm. from the from the floor of the the jungle, and it's actually what, uh, oh, what's it called? Avatar, the movie oh, okay. was was modeled after those giant pyres of of granite coming up from the from the floor of the jungle, and uh, really cool place. Anyway, <laughs> the story is. <laughs> I, I was in Guilin and I was trying to get across the border into Vietnam and I went to the train station to buy myself a ticket to go on the next leg of my trip. And it took me a half a day to get a train ticket just because I didn't know which line to stand in. I couldn't speak the language. <laughs> Nobody at the train station could speak my language. So I was the tall white guy standing yeah. in the middle of a sea of Chinese people and they're all looking at me like, what are you doing here? <laughs> It was a really uncomfortable afternoon until yeah. I finally figured out I need to be in that line. <laughs> There's one person there that can speak English. And, but then you just learn to embrace those, those moments of, mm, I don't yeah. know what to do now. And, and once you get comfortable with that, you, you realize that you can handle it. How do you uh, like face that fear? I mean, being in a country where you don't know the language, you don't know the people, a lot of times it's places for you that maybe aren't well known at all. I mean, how do you even go about that? You just do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the only answer I can give you. Yeah, and, yeah. And you know I mean, you know yourself, right? You know if, if you can put yourself in that situation and overcome that fear and accomplish it. And when I first started traveling, I, there were several moments where I literally had to just sit down on the curb or, you know, 
sit down in the lobby of my hotel and I'm like, okay, I'm really freaking out like right now. Not, not yeah, necessarily yeah. a panic attack, <laughs> but there are moments when you realize maybe I'm in over my head. Uh, but it's like everything you do in life, right? When you get a promotion, when you get into a position where you're managing other people, you take on a big project, somebody gives you more responsibility than you've ever had before. At first, there's that panic, like, I've never been here. How do I handle this? And then you, you slow your mind down, step yourself through it. Okay, I do this, and then I do this, and then I do this. Just take it step by step. And like anything, if you're a competent, professional, <laughs> capable person, you'll figure out, okay, I'm going to step through this. And, and then after you've done it a couple of times, it's just part of you. Yeah. And as professionals, we learn to embrace that, right? We learn to embrace the the challenge, embrace somebody bringing a new experience to us. And, and then we sort of look forward to it. Mm -hmm. When somebody puts a new big project on your, on your desk and says, you're in charge of this now. Oh, and you've got a staff of 12 people that you manage now to take care of this. All right, I, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the same thing with, you know, yeah, with traveling to unknown or remote places. I think Richard Branson said uh, best when he was said, um, uh, if you get an offer, say yes and figure out how to do it later type of thing, you know? Yeah, Definitely. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I have one friend that, that did exactly that. He went to Iceland uh, without like any preparation. He ended up sleeping in his car for like a, a couple nights, but he said it was a, like a life changing experience, you know? Um. Wait, are you gonna say? <laughs> well, there's so let me speak to that real quickly. There's there is a if you like especially if you follow on Instagram any kind of travel hashtags or travel bloggers. There's a big movement afoot that basically is all about digital nomadism, and you can quit your job and go live like mm -hmm. this, and you you don't have to uh, you know you don't have to have all the luxuries and and I. Don't subscribe to that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think also, it also varies on the person. I mean, some people, anybody that's telling you that this is a lifestyle for everyone is clearly just looking for your money and your time. Uh, it, nothing's for everyone. You know, it's impossible. <laughs> like some people could live in the car. Great. Go live in the car. But me, like I'm not going to live in the car. I don't care how, you know, amazing it was for that person. That's not for me. You know, <laughs> I agree. Um and, and, and that goes with just with life, you know, like anyone telling you that what they're doing is for everyone is either looking for the money in your pocket or they just don't have the wisdom to know that nothing is for everyone. And and I, I say, you know, kind of the same thing, like my other thing is photography. Uh, I love to practice my photography when I travel. I, it, I spend a lot of time learning it. And you'll get onto a path where somebody says, this is how you're supposed to do something. OK, try it. I mean, yeah. you got to have a starting point, right? You got to have somebody that gives you some direction and says, go this direction. Okay. I go that direction for a couple of months or a year or however long. And then I decide, you know what? This doesn't take me where I want to go. Mm -hmm. This is taking me on somebody else's path. This yeah. is their trajectory. Mine is over here. I'm going to shift. But you have to start somewhere to learn the skills to get to your own trajectory. Yeah. Does that makes sense. No, definitely. It really does. Um, these type of trips, like we kind of talked about how some people sleep in their car or whatever, but, uh, can you generally go on these remote trips for three or four days or do you have to kind of <clears throat> subscribe to a longer vacation or a longer journey? I would say it takes longer. Uh, even if you do know exactly where you're going, there are going to be a lot of unknowns along the way, whether, whether that's transportation or the hotel you're going to stay at or, the the road is blocked for some reason or the bus is broke down to go where you want to go or to come back uh give yourself time yeah. uh, if you're going to do a remote a remote trip and and that's that's kind of why as i've as i've gotten older i've taken on more responsibilities in my life i have i'm married i've got two kids now uh i have to be home at specific times mm -hmm. my my wife works as well she's a she's a professional uh in in medicine and she has a set schedule. So I can't just go and then not worry about when I get back. Yeah. So for that purpose, if I'm going to go on one of those remote trips, we have, <laughs> we have support in place. Yeah. I say, okay, if I'm not back by this date, if my flight <laughs> gets canceled, if my bus breaks down coming back to the airport, you know, grandma's going to help take care of the kids. We've got, we've got contingency plans. Yeah. So if you know, you know, I've got a short period. No, don't don't yeah. try and go to some remote beach and, <laughs> and go on an epic adventure. Yeah. Uh, however, that that being said, uh, like that's kind of the reason why <clears throat> like why I started organizing my own trips, uh, mm -hmm. because I want to 
I want to see certain things when I'm in a country. I want to ride my bike when I'm there. And these are the styles of travel that I like to do. Uh, so if other people want to go on that style of trip, uh, they, they want to experience a location in their, in their own way. Mm -hmm. Like they have to have a, a con or a plan to know, uh, how am I, how am I going to go about saying this? It's a, it's a framework for you to enjoy your, your trip, to have those remote experiences without <laughs> the risk, yeah. if you will. You want somebody else there, uh, to, have already done the research to know how long it's going to take to get from this place to this place. And if our bus does break down, we have a contingency plan. If you get sick because you ate the wrong thing yeah. or you ate something that you're not used to eating, yeah. how do we handle that? Yeah. You know, do it. So all of those little plans that that's why, and I like, I don't do much luxury travel, but I call luxury travel for me is an itinerary knowing that I'm going where somebody else has already scouted. They've got the plan in place. They know that they're going to get me back home at, an, at a certain date. But then between point A and point B, there's a ton of freedom in there for me to explore mm -hmm. different places and, and different things. So like for myself, I, I run bike tours. If it's a photographer that's going on a trip to Iceland or Patagonia, they're going to take you there with the intention of, you know, we have a structure. We know how we're going to hike out to this location photograph it and then come back home. But within those days, you've got a ton of freedom to explore on your own, right? Yeah, that's very I true. I think I went off topic as far as no, your no, question. No, <laughs> no, that's so true. I, I think so my channel, as you know, we talk about uh, money, investing, law school and practicing law. And um, by the end of the episode, I always want my listeners to realize that uh, almost at, like things are almost never reinvented. Like most things have been here for a while, except for Bitcoin, cryptocurrency and stuff like that, right? Traveling is not suddenly this new thing that people are doing now in America. You know, this has been done for, for forever, you know, uh, and having a mentor or someone leading you is always a benefit because one way to kind of reduce fear for people who want to travel to places that are kind of unknown to them is by also talking to someone like you, you know? Where it's like, yes, you know, if you go there, you know, don't eat the chicken, right? Because the chicken <laughs> is is not good there. You know, you don't want to try that. Because I also had, um, this is like, this is not a remote place. Uh, it's Las Vegas. And I had a friend that went to Las Vegas and got um, sick. Uh, and he was sick during his whole entire break because he ate the fish at some casino that everyone knows, like, don't eat the fish there, you know? So the last thing you want to do is go to, like, let's say some beautiful place in Africa. Day one, you eat something you shouldn't be eating and you're out the rest of the trip, you know? Uh, but yeah, that has happened to me. So if you're going to do any kind of remote travel like that and you are like me, I like to eat everything. If somebody puts it in front of me, especially if they're my host, I'm going to eat it because yeah, I'm not going to say no, yeah. uh, Cipro, Cipro Flaxen. It's, uh, it's oh. like a industrial strength antibiotic. Oh, Don't take it all the time. <laughs> but if you're, if you're in a, in a country and you eat something that gives you a real stomach bug. You just feel like, uh, yeah, you know, feel, don't feel well. Cipro is the, huh. the traveler's drug of choice. If someone offered me that, I would honestly, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have any idea. Like, I'd be like, no, I'm good. Nope. <laughs> I'll take more of the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so what's a personality do you, do you think a person needs to have uh, to go on one of these trips? Do you have to be some crazy adventurer that, that leaves mm -hmm. his job and, and goes to these crazy places? No, no, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, you, know, you don't have to be a digital nomad. You don't have to you know, leave your life and leave your job in order to go have a good travel experience. Uh, you just have to be open to open to new experiences mm -hmm. and and willing to, you know, willing to see the world in that way. So if I have a short time to go on a trip somewhere, I'm going to go somewhere that I know I roughly know what's going to happen, whether it's with my wife, we're going to sit on the beach at a at a place in Cancun for a week and that's it. That's all we want to do. Maybe we're going to take a day, go diving. Maybe we're going to drive into town and get some lunch, you know, but I, that's a relaxing trip to me. Uh, if I'm going on a scouting trip for one of my bike tours, like Colombia, uh, is uh, Colombia, Argentina is a good place that I'm, I'm planning one next. Uh, I have a very loose schedule there and I, I know that when I go, I just have to have an open mind. Mm -hmm. Not everything's going to work out the way I want it to. And that's okay. 
But when I get home, then I'll have a, re a reflection period on that or a postmortem of my trip and say, okay, here's what I learned from it. Here's what I got out of it. Here's who I am because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I have that luxury of just that freedom. Sometimes I don't. When I don't have that freedom and I know I've only got time for a short trip, I'm going to take one of those pre-planned itineraries. I might go to go to Rome and I'm going to spend four days in Rome. I'm going to see the Vatican. I'm going to see the Colosseum. I'm going to see the catacombs. I'm going to, you know, go photograph all of the main sites mm -hmm. within. That's a quick trip. If I, and, and some people are that way. They just want to know exactly what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. that's one mindset. If you're going to go do a remote trip or just kind of go into an, an unknown sort of uh, sort of trip, you have to have a mindset that you're accepting of that and I'm just going to go where it takes me and I'm going to make the most of it. And how do you outsource a lot of the legwork? Is there a way to outsource like the legwork when you're going to places that are more remote? Because it's pretty easy to like, if you want to go to Italy, uh, you could go anywhere really. Like Costco has packages. You could even go to Italy with like certain really popular places. But how do you, sure. out, how do you outsource these type of um, things when you're going to when you're trying to go to more remote areas? Well, use a use an individual uh, you know travel advisor we call them ground operators mm -hmm. in the adventure travel business uh, but there are so there are a lot more people like myself that are customizing trips based on specific interests mm -hmm. mine is cycling and photography pretty specific and the the travel adventure travel business is really going that way where it's individual operators who have a niche that's you know super specific so you can find i mean yeah, things have changed a lot in the last five years even. Yeah. Uh, you can find somebody that does a super specific type of trip. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. uh, find an operator that goes there and offers that specific experience that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Or if you're like myself, like I'm going to scout something, um, a lot of times I don't know. And you can research, I mean, internet being what it is, you can research the location to death before you get there. But almost inevitably, once you get on the ground and you start talking to people, it's going to change. Mm -hmm. So myself, I, I set myself a framework like I'm going to be here on Monday. I'm going to be here on Wednesday. I'm going to be here on Friday. That's it. Mm -hmm. I only plan those three stops for my week. How I'm going to get from point A to point B might change once I get there. And usually it does because once I've talked to my cab driver and he's taken me to the hotel and I talk to the people at the hotel – or I meet somebody at the market, I start asking them, how do I get here? What do you suggest seeing in this city? It's going to be totally different than what I read on somebody's travel blog that said top 10 things to see yeah. here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because the person that lives there is going to suggest different things than somebody that was just writing it to get eyeballs clicking to their blog. Yeah, that happened to me. I went to uh, I was doing like a road trip from New Jersey to Florida. Uh, and it was about 18 hours and I went on Instagram, saw a beautiful picture of a place called devil's pit. Uh, it was, it, it was a good experience. I'm not going to like make this place sound horrible. It was great. But when I got there, the photos make it, made it look like remote, some beautiful oasis. I got there. There were just like tons of barbecues, like families, barbecues, <laughs> little kids, adults. Like it was, it pretty much looked like six flags. Um, and I, I was not very happy when I got there. Um, it wasn't that bad, but, but still. Uh, that, that well, that's travel photography 101. <laughs> I mean, you got to make the place look like, you know, look ten times better than it actually is. Yeah, yeah. Like um, most of those sites that you see in Iceland are like that. You you get there and you realize, wow, I'm standing on a boardwalk with <laughs> 200 other people staring at this waterfall. <laughs> it's not exactly out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so you mentioned one thing that that was interesting. How do you communicate with people in in these countries where if you don't speak the language? Very carefully. Um, I almost always can find somebody who does speak some English. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm terrible with learning the, the local languages. But uh, before I go there, I always learn at least five words. You know, hello, thank you, what's your name, where's the bathroom, uh, I, need, I need something to eat. I, so I learn, you know, five or six basic phrases mm -hmm. so that I can, I can break down that barrier initially. And yeah. just say something in their language, uh, and from there, either they'll either they'll shake their head and they'll walk away <laughs> and say, "I don't know English," or eventually, like uh, I was uh, I was traveling around Java, Indonesia. Usually, when you go to Indonesia, you think of Bali. That's the tourist mm -hmm. location. For me, I wanted to go to Java because there were 
I wanted to see Mount Egin, which is a big uh, volcanic crater that you can hike down into, and there's an acid sulfur lake at the bottom of it. It was a cool spot for photos, <laughs> so I wanted to go there. Uh, and then there's a turtle hatchery beach on the south south shore. Two things I couldn't find on Bali, so I wanted to go to Java. So I'm in a, a market on the shores of, of Java, Indonesia, and I was trying to ask the shop owner, how do I get to the top of that mountain because I want to photograph the, the crater? And she was just shaking her head at me. She's like, no, I know it. No English, no English. Uh, and then this guy walked up from the other side of the market and he knew English. He heard me talking, trying to figure out where I was going. So almost inevitably there is somebody, uh, yeah. he gave me directions and he actually ended up uh, taking me around the Island, around oh. that part of the Island for two days on the back of his motorcycle. Uh, so if, if you put yourself out there, things do work out. Yeah. And do you find out you're genuinely like welcome in, in these locations or do you feel some hostility? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on the location. Mm -hmm. It really does. Uh, I, I, so I just spent the last two years kind of traveling through Morocco cause I did a, did a bike tour there. Some of the cities, people are super friendly to photographers and travelers and they want to help you out. And some of the cities, they are very reticent. They see, they see tourists there and they see us as intruding on their way of life. Mm -hmm. And it, they, within adventure travel, the, the popular phrase right now is travel like a local. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that you're, that you're trying to, you know, do the things that the native people, that the people yeah. who live there do. That's great for us as travelers, but yeah. for the people that live there, sometimes it's not, sometimes yeah. they don't want you getting into their lives and, yeah. and sticking a camera in their face. Yeah. So it, it pays to be sensitive to that. Absolutely. That's true. And especially, so my family, they're from the small, small towns in Brazil and uh, you, you you can't also fool them. Like if you go in and you're, you know, like for instance in Brazil, right? If you if you went into let's say uh, like a pub and started dancing samba, you know, like <laughs> like you're clearly white. You know, like I'm not gonna suddenly <laughs> yes. be like, oh, is that a Brazilian over there? No, like <laughs> we're not gonna be fooled. But at the same point, like you said, like you want to also be respectful. If you go there and you know you're I don't know making fun of people because they're dancing differently than, than than we do here or or you're taking photos right in front of their faces, you know, and you're making it uncomfortable, you know, you also have to respect their space. So I think it's really cool the way you go about it, where it's like a balance. You're, you're being respectful, but also understanding that, Hey, this is their, their home, their life. Right. We're, we're just passing through and eventually we're going to leave and they have to, they have to live there every day. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's something I, I didn't know right away when I specifically, when I started practicing photography, I would, I would be the guy that's got like two cameras on my, on my hip. And I'm, I'm like just going around photographing everything. And then, and then I walk into a market and there's this lady that always, walks up to you and goes, goes like this and puts her finger up in front of your <laughs> lens. I'm like, what is she doing? She's, yeah, yeah. she's telling me to stop. She doesn't want me to take her picture. Yeah. Like it just, it took me a bit to, to understand, but just being sensitive to people and you can read the room when you walk in, you know, are people welcoming of you being oh, there? Yeah. Are they going to help you out or do they not want you there? Oh yeah, definitely. So you mentioned um, about how you do biking tours. Uh, I'm curious as to, so the way I see it is that could really improve your experience traveling. Uh, but also I'm like, a part of me is, would think that's terrifying biking around areas you don't know, or, I mean, what are the dangers to that? Also, um, if you could talk a little bit about how amazing that is. So if you're, if you're a cyclist, uh, you know, you, you kind of understand already the idea that, you know, getting on a bike gives you a connection to a place that you don't get in any other way. Uh, I remember places that I've ridden my bike through just the way they smell, the way they look. I remember how the road feels just riding it. Uh, so I have that connection to that place in a, in a way that I wouldn't get if I were driving it and just looking out the window, like, a, you know, it's passing me like a movie, like I were watching a movie. Uh, so that's why I want to get on my bike and ride that place. It connects me to the place. Yeah. Same goes for photography for me. It's I'm active. I'm, it changes my awareness of my surroundings. I'm looking for things to photograph. I'm looking at the way the sun is hitting the, hitting the hills. I'm looking at, you know, that, cloud that's moving across the sky. I'm, I'm just paying more attention because I'm participating in it. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> those are the benefits to it. Uh, and the reason to do it primarily with other people is, is safety, uh, safety and logistics, just somebody else. Like we were talking about, you know, somebody else who has been there and planned it. They know that I'm going to get you from point A to point B. We're going to do it safely. We've got 
a support vehicle carrying your luggage. Uh, we've got a mechanic in the in the van with parts for your bike if something breaks. Uh, just those things that I call that luxury travel for me. It's just knowing that somebody else has thought of these things. I can just I can just relax and yeah. enjoy it. That is my luxury. Is I've paid somebody else to take care of those details, and I'm just there to to relax and enjoy it. And do you find so? In the legal industry, as you, I'm sure you know, attorneys are just so busy. It's, it's. If you think you know, you probably don't even know. Like it, it's pre- <laughs> really crazy. Uh, like all the places that I inter, all the places I interned at, all the firms that I went to, the attorneys seemed like uh, they're just always working. I mean, they were there till midnight, one a.m., two a.m. Uh, at a certain point, I thought they were sleeping in their offices. So, yep. so what you're, what you're, um. I guess advertising in a way is really, de- really desirable. I think to, to to attorneys that don't have the time to do these. Like they could take vacations, but they don't have the time to plan them, uh, because planning is also a full time job, right? So, so if you're planning to go on some <laughs> remote location for two weeks, it's going to be like a lot of planning. Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty cool concept. Is this is this new or or has this been around for a while? Well, the idea of cycling vacations themselves has been around for a while. There are a lot of there's a lot of competition in the space. But the reason I started doing this for myself, which is the cycling combined with photography on these trips is it's a niche that I was looking for myself and it doesn't exist. Nobody does these kind of trips. Mm -hmm. So I'm an experienced traveler. I've been in business. I understand how to line up vendors, take care of the payments, just organize all those logistics. I'm just I just decided I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it happen for myself. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started in it. And then I realized, damn, this is expensive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm paying a lot of vendors to take me to this country and, you know, take me to all these locations and get my photos. And why don't I just open it up and make it a thing where I invite other people to come with me and we'll spread the costs out and make yeah. it, <laughs> make it make sense for everybody. So, uh, I, I don't think that answers your question exactly. But. No, no, it, do, it does. Um, because what I'm talking about is, is a lot, like you said, like people sometimes want to go on these vacations and, and in my case like a lot of attorneys have the money to go but but time is a resource you can't put money to right so like so the fact that they could actually reach out to you and be like all right i want to go here what do you suggest and how can we do this and like you said kind of spread the cost in the way i'm sure spread the responsibilities uh which i think is a great thing but one concern i have is food so i'm not a picky eater i i eat everything under the moon like i i love all food i love indian food chinese food i love brazilian food i love pizza um i'm not a picky eater uh it, it's it's dangerous that i'll eat poison like if you put it in front of me and it's <laughs> it's very dangerous so but how would you um talk to someone about traveling to remote places if they're picky eaters uh it, pretty much anywhere in the world you can find what you're looking for if you if you're specific about it and I get the question all the time on my trips. There's always somebody on the trip that's uh, that can't eat certain things. It has dietary restrictions. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the gals that went on my tour in Morocco, she has Crohn's disease, which is very difficult. She has you know very short list of things she can eat, yeah. and we so she sent me her dietary restrictions. Said I eat these things. I don't eat these things. Sent that ahead to our hotels. And <clears throat> in every case, they were able to find foods that she could eat. And she was a little bit adventurous as well. She ate some things that she doesn't normally eat, which I don't normally recommend, uh, especially if you're if you're on a long trip. You don't want to, like you said, you know, make yourself sick when you start the trip and, <laughs> and then not enjoy the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, if you if you plan ahead, uh, tell you know whoever's organizing your trip, hey, these are things I can't eat. Are there things that I can eat on this trip? You can almost inevitably find something uh, as a contingency plan. Uh, I mean, be, be willing to eat whatever somebody serves to you, especially yeah. if you're in a remote place and you have a host that's Ooh, yeah. letting you into their home. Definitely. Uh, I, I was in, I was in Jordan with, uh, with a cabbie who took me to, uh, to, uh, what was it? Petra. And on the way back to, uh, back to, uh, Aqaba, Jordan, uh, he, he took me to his parents' house. Yeah. He said, Hey, we're, we're driving right past their, their town. Can we stop? So he took me to his parents' house and I was sitting there with his dad and his brother and his mom and his sister comes in with a bowl of soup. Uh, it was like this lima bean soup. And she just set it on the table in front of me. He looked at me and he just had this big <laughs> grin on his face. I ate the whole bowl. And then we, as we were leaving, he goes, 
you didn't have to eat that. That was terrible. Why did you eat that? Because <laughs> <laughs> she put it in front of me. Yeah, yeah. Hey, but that's a good choice because I know at least for, for my part of Brazil, when the person offers you food, uh, it's not like a rule, but if you, if you don't say yes, it makes them sad. It makes them think, all right, is it because like you don't like my cooking? Do you think I'm not clean? Like you, you just they start thinking that the most offensive things that could possibly be the case, you know, when in reality it could be because, you know, because you don't like lima beans. But yeah, uh, in Brazil, if you go to Brazil and they offer you the worst soup, uh, I suggest you also drink it as well. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's great. Um, so Kevin, uh, if a person wants to get in contact with you uh, and get some more information about what you do, uh, how could they do that? The best place to find me is intentionallylost.com. That's my primary website. That's where I do all of the, the bike tours info from. I uh, have an Instagram, Kevin Wenning, mm-hmm. just my, my full name Yeah. Uh, on Instagram is a good place to find me as well. It's where I do most of my sharing of the photos. And then uh, Another project that I kicked off uh, just this year is called employeeartprogram.com. Hmm. Uh, so those are my my three main websites. Great. And if, if anybody out there uh, ends up going on a trip with you, I expect some photos and some hashtags as well. <laughs> there, there is one. There is one one thought that I, I want to share that I think is I think is super important. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people who start traveling or who have never done a lot of travel or maybe are disillusioned with travel uh, of some sort. The, my primary advice is when you go travel someplace, base your itinerary on doing things that you personally like. So mm-hmm. for me, that's my cycling and photography. And for you, that might be going to the best restaurants in a city. That might be going to the best museums or art galleries or seeing, you know, whatever is on that top 10, you know, checklist that somebody sent in their, <laughs> wrote in their blog. Yeah. But whatever it is, you know, don't go somewhere just because it, somebody else recommended it. If it's not something that personally resonates with you that you wouldn't that you wouldn't do with your free time at home, mm-hmm. don't go travel to a foreign country and do it because then you're going to hate yourself doubly when you get home and go, man, I wasted all that time and money going there and I didn't enjoy any of that. Yeah. Uh, so no, that that's uh, my my top concept, I guess, for people when planning your travels. Just when you when you're thinking about it go do things that you would normally enjoy doing with your free time. Mm-hmm. And then by going in and stretching yourself, going to another country where there's different food, different language, different atmosphere, uh, you'll become a different person by just having those same experiences in a different setting around different people. Yeah, that's actually really, uh, I don't hear that often. I think that's really true because a lot of people will tell me, oh, go to Rome. They have beautiful uh, cathedrals and buildings. I'm not really, I look, is it beautiful? Yes. Um, it's also beautiful on my phone, when, <laughs> my phone on Instagram. <laughs> Doesn't mean I need to like pay a bunch of money to go there. I, I much rather go, like you said, to like uh, to Thailand, to somewhere. I love nature, you know, like I get enough technology and buildings in my daily life. I'd rather go somewhere where it's remote. Um, not Devil's Pit in Florida, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, awesome. Thank you for joining us today. And I hope to have you back, uh, especially, uh, um, as your business grows as well, I'm going to have you back and we could talk more about, uh, uh, how your journey is going, where to go, where not to go and any crazy stories you have. I'm sure there will be plenty to yeah. share. You're always welcome. <laughs> thank you, Chris. All right. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Be well. What's up, guys? I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find us on SoundCloud, YouTube, Google Play Podcasts, and of course, dmghpodcast.com.